a few minutes ago, I forgot to say good morning this morning, and that might be why people really dragged this morning. Couldn't have been bad preaching, so that, that's, uh, we'll, uh, we'll blame it on the no good morning this morning. Uh, we are going to continue on in our Mark Your Bible series. So if you will uh, grab your Bibles, open up, and we're going to do number 23, which is the one on worldliness, and I believe our first passage is over in John 15. So if you want to grab your Bibles and open up to John 15, that's where we will begin. Just recently, uh, we just lived through what is supposed to be the day of gratitude, Thanksgiving, the day we... We all love, we feast, we, we uh, probably do more than feast, we eat way more than our fill on a day, and we're supposed to remember all the things that we're thankful for, which is very ironically followed by probably the greatest day of greed in our country called Black Friday, which is the day you erase everything you did on Thursday saying thank you And you say, give me more, 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 because that's kind of the way Black Friday goes. You will trample people on your way into store to save money because you want to buy more stuff. Uh, And that kind of the, the cliched way those two days get handled. And we look at that kind of... Um, exposure, that, that type of event, and, and we kind of shake our head at it going, that, that's just so ridiculous. We would never trample somebody on our way to save money buying a TV, or, you know, we're just, we're just not that materialistic. We're not that worldly. And while we might not be when it comes to saving 20% on an item at Walmart, we probably are in other ways. And that's where I think it's good for us to sit back and look at what the Bible teaches about the concept of worldliness and how we can better understand our position, our role, our responsibilities in this world. So we're going to spend some time tonight looking at a series of verses about worldliness. And as I said earlier, our first one is in John chapter 15, verse 19. John 15, verse 19. Jesus In the upper room, we're going to spend some time on Wednesday night, shameless plug for our class on Wednesday night, talking about the upper room discussion or discourse that Jesus has with his disciples uh, and all of those kind of last few hours of Jesus' life. But he makes this statement right smack dab in the middle of his conversation with the disciples in the upper room right before he is arrested and taken to the cross. And he says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. However, because you were not of the world, but I have chosen you out of it, the world hates you. If we belong to Jesus, because those are the people we're talking about here, those who were chosen by Jesus out of the world. So, If we belong to Jesus, that means we do not belong to the world. And I really want you to see it that way. The scriptures make it very broad and black line between belonging to God and Jesus and belonging to the world. And you cannot keep a foot in both. You just can't. If you want to have a foot in the world, you cannot reach where Jesus is. Is that clear? And the Bible is absolutely hands down. You'll see this tonight as we go through these verses. The Bible is adamant. You cannot belong both to the world and to Jesus. And so you are left with a choice. Would you rather belong to the world and the pleasures that are here for a temporary time, or would you rather belong to Jesus, the one who loves you more than you love yourself, for eternity? Now, when I word it that way, it, it, it's kind of easy to make that choice, isn't it? It's hard to make that choice every day, though. It's hard to make that choice when you're forced with decisions all day long about fitting in, about making life easy, about being comfortable. 
And that's really, I think, oftentimes where worldliness gets us. It doesn't get us with an 80-inch TV 20% marked off. That, that's not really where the world traps most of us. The world traps us not in necessarily having more, where I think the world most often traps us is in having comfort, having ease. And that's not really the option Jesus gives us. Jesus makes it clear you belong to one or the other. John chapter 12, John chapter 12. Over here, John chapter 12, starting in verse 42. Nevertheless, many did believe in him, even among the rulers, but because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him. That they would not be banned from the synagogue. For they loved human praise more than praise from God. Did you, did you hear that last statement? They loved human praise more than they loved praise from God. Jesus says, you either belong to me or you belong to the world. I, I, either I can choose you out of the world and make you something different, or you can belong to the world. That, those, that's your choice, one or the other, not a little of both. You have one or the other. And because of that, you are also choosing whether you would want to have praise from God or praise from men. There's a lot of people that choose praise from men. And, and I think the reason for that is clear. I've never yet had God pat me on the back. You? I, I, we, we don't have God come down and give us daily accolade. Now, we know God loves us daily. We know there are promises in his scriptures that we can read. We can read proclamations of his love on a daily basis. You know, those things, absolutely we can do that. But we don't have the same sort of connection oftentimes with God that it is so easy to have with the world. And there's that word ease again. It is very easy to search after the praise of men, the honors of men, the accolades of men, the, the you know, being lifted up on a pedestal by the world around you. That, that is easy to pursue. It's an easy trap to fall into. It's an easy goal to set for yourself. I want to get that raise. I want to earn respect. I want to have people look up to me. I want people to come to me to ask me for advice. I want to be seen as, as a giant among my peers. Or we can be praised by God. Intellectually, we know what the right choice is. But on a day-to-day -day basis, on a life decision basis, it's hard to choose God over the world. But that, that is, we look at stories like what we have here in John 12, where people do choose the praise of men over the praise of God, and we kind of shake our head at them, but we, we need to be careful, because we can fall in that same trap. Luke chapter 21 Luke chapter 21, verse 34, reads this way. Be on your guard so that your minds are not dulled from carousing, from drunkenness, and from worries of life, or that day will come on you unexpectedly. So here, here's the difficulty with this. I, I, again, I, I think we read that passage and we go, well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I'm not going to get involved in carousing. I'm not going to go get drunk. I, I'm not going to find myself pursuing the worries of life. But we do. We do. I mean, who in here has ever worried about where food's going to come from? Me and you, Charlie, we're the only ones worried about anything ever. 
I mean, who in here is ever worried about, about how, how am I going to have a job a month from now? Who in here is ever worried about uh, if, if, if the people around me are going to accept me? Who in here is ever worried about family issues working out? We do get ourselves caught up in the worries of life. We get ourselves very burdened. And Scripture is clear that you can't. That, that the worries of life are not really what life is about. That we need to guard ourselves against being weighed down by the world because ultimately the worries of the world don't add up to a lot. If you really, and, and we've all been told this, and again, this is all, there's a lot of things we know in our head that we don't necessarily apply to our daily life, but, uh, you know, uh, people will say things to put life in perspective, like, will this matter a hundred years from now? You, have you ever heard that, ex that expression? Have you ever used that on yourself? Because I have many, many times. Or one that we use oftentimes in our house is, did this matter a hundred years ago? Because our world is constantly changing and new technologies and people get caught up with all the, the changes of life and we're like, you know what, clearly this doesn't matter that much because a hundred years ago they didn't care about this at all. It didn't even exist. So it, it, you put life in perspective of time, whether you're looking in the future or whether you're looking in the past, a lot of the worries that we we burden ourselves with, get put in perspective. That doesn't change the fact that tomorrow I'm going to be worried about tomorrow because tomorrow has a lot of troubles of its own. And I'm going to be worried about the bills and I'm going to be worried about whether uh, my, my, my children are being uh, set up right for the college degree they want to pursue and that's really more my wife's worry than mine. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be worried about whether they're behaving right if they're not in my presence. I'm going to be worried about whether I'm the kind of uh, a person that I should be, and I'm going to be beating myself up about all the things I should have gotten done that get and get, didn't get done. And, and I'm just going to, I'm going to weigh myself down with all of these things. And honestly, in the scheme of things, none of those things actually matter. None of those things really make a difference. And if, if I could put aside the worries of the world for the sake of putting my focus back on Jesus, I would do better. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Starting in verse 14, do not be yoked together with those who do not believe. For what partnership is there between righteousness and lawlessness? Or what fellowship does light have with darkness? What agreement does Christ have with Belial? What does a believer have in common with an unbeliever? What agreement does the temple of God have with idols? For we are the temple of the living God. As God said, I will dwell and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they will be my people. Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch any unclean thing, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you will be sons and daughters to me, says the Almighty. We need to be very cautious about yoking ourselves equally with the world. I, I'm going to say something that probably... Again, one of those things we know in our head, but might not be one of those things we apply in everyday life. You don't need the world to succeed. You don't need a particular job. You don't need a particular friendship. You don't need some sort of worldly standard of success. You don't need some possession some car, some house, some ideal life in order to be successful. You need none of that. I'm going to tell you the one thing you need to be successful on this earth, and that is a relationship 
with God. That's it. That's honestly the single only thing you need is a relationship with God. Everything else is extra or a distraction. Everything else. And I will even go so far to say that is true even of your family, even of the people in your life. Now, if you have a family, I'm not saying desert them because that ruins your relationship with God. And I'm not saying if you're married, you can mistreat your spouse because that ruins your relationship with God. But, but the point is, a single person doesn't need to be married to be successful. And, and a, a, a father doesn't need more children in order to be successful. All you need is God. That's it. And that is really hard to bring yourself to believe. But that, I believe, is what Paul is teaching us here, is that we are not to yoke ourselves together with something from this world if that thing is going to pull us away from our relationship with God. What he says here, you don't need all of these different arrangements, you know, partnership between righteousness and lawlessness, you know, light with darkness. Notice what it moves on to. I will be their God. They will be my people. I will be a father to you. You will be sons and daughters to me. What is the answer? Do not have a partnership with the world. Instead, have a relationship with me. That's the answer. And, and I, I say all of that because this slaps me in the face. I, I have been one to pursue raises or pursue the next job, or pursue a secondary job, or pursue something else other than preaching because I could do more over here. Or I, I've, I've been that person. I've been the person looking for the, the, the pot of gold at the end of the rainbow. And what I should be doing is just sitting back and being amazed that I worship a God who created the rainbow. That's it. Anything other than that is a distraction or it's just extra. And, and we need to keep things in those terms. Philippians chapter 3, verse 18 through 21. Philippians 3, 18 through 21. For I have often told you, and now say again with tears, that many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their end is destruction. Their God is their stomach. Their glory is in their shame, and they are focused on earthly things. Now, let me stop there for a moment and make a comment. That is so easily you and me. Now, I, I might not literally spend all day worrying about what's going in my stomach next. Okay, I, and, and I don't. I don't. Typically, although I do have these, uh, never mind. Um, I, that, that's, not, that's not my struggle. That's not something I, I, I really worry about. Now, I have on occasion worried about will there be anything to put into my stomach? I've had those worries before. And maybe not on a daily basis, but uh, we're, we're, we're going to run out of money before the end of the month. And, and, and that, that's a difficult thing. It is a difficult circumstance to live not knowing, live with, with only your hope in God providing being there for you. I, I might not be one who is, who is pursuing glory after glory after glory. I, I want all the praise of men. I, I want to all the, the, the next big thing that I, I want to have all this stuff. I want to have all these earthly things. But I've been that. And I think probably many of us have. But read on with me. 
Our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly wait for a Savior from there, the Lord Jesus Christ. He will transform the body of our humble condition into the likeness of his glorious body by the power that enables him to subject everything to himself. Here's what I want you to, to note about this. The answer to pursuing the things of this world is to remember that we don't belong to this world. That's, that's the answer. Realize that your citizenship is somewhere else. Realize that, that as great as filling your belly and having that next promotion might be, they are nothing compared to the transformation that will happen to us one day by the power of Jesus Christ. That's really where our attention and our hope and our, uh, that, that, that's where we should be fixed. That, that should be the goal. That should be the goal. I don't mean one of many goals. I don't mean the main goal. I mean the only goal. Going to heaven. And, and not going to heaven because, hey, that's my prize, that's what I get. Going to heaven because that's where we get to go be with our Savior. That, that, that's really what this is about. I love that even in this passage it talks about their glory is their shame, and that is contrasted with the likeness of his glorious body. Where is glory really found? Here? In transformation. That's where glory is found. You can be the most successful earthly person in the world, and it is nothing compared to being transformed into the likeness of his glorious body. Nothing. And that should satisfy you and me. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3 through 4. 2 Timothy chapter 2, 3 and 4. Share in the suffering as a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in the concerns of civilian life. He seeks to please the commanding officer. I love that description. It goes right along with our sermon from this morning, right? The idea of of uh, wielding the sword of the Spirit, being an effective soldier in God's army. Well, one of the ways to be an effective soldier in God's army is to quit being distracted by this world where we're fighting. Keith and I were talking after and Scott, and, and Keith made the, the comment that really the way we need to view ourselves is we are soldiers on deployment. I love that. that. That idea of we are in a place we don't belong. We are supposed to stay ready for battle. As soon as the commanding officer says go, we need to be suited up and ready to go and do the work he has asked us to do. When you are a soldier on deployment, you don't get yourself wrapped up in local or, or agriculture. I, I yet to hear of a soldier who is living on deployment in some temporary barracks, no, not sure at all how long they're going to be at this particular location because they're going to get up and move at some point because that's what you do on deployment. Yet they've gone and tilled this plot of land over here and they've they planted seeds and they've got this beautiful garden set up. They're not doing that. They're not setting up shop over here. Their life is about their service. That's it. That, that, you don't go into the local town and buy a bunch of trinkets uh, so that now you've got a whole bunch of extra stuff to carry around on you next time you've got to set out to march. You, you don't do that when you're on deployment. You don't do that when you are not at home. Brothers and sisters, we are not at home. This is not our home. This is not what our existence is about. We are soldiers on deployment. We do not get entangled in concerns of civilian life 
if we are truly serving the commanding officer. Now, how often do we struggle with that? James chapter 4, verse 4 is a bit bolder even than some of the ones that we've already talked about. James says over here, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? So whoever wants to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. You, you remember that either-or proposition I gave to you at the beginning of the lesson tonight? That there's a big, broad line between belonging to Jesus and belonging to the world? James is making the same point. If you decide you want to be friendly with the world, you are, by those actions and decisions, making yourself an enemy of God. You willing to do that? And, and it's interesting the way James describes those who are willing to do that. They are adulteresses. They have cheated on their covenant with God with another lover. That, that's the image here. You willing to cheat on God? To break your covenant with God so that you might have something uh, this world has to offer? You're, you're willing to throw away a relationship with a God who loves you like you've never been loved before. He loves you no matter what struggles and what difficulties you have, no matter what failures you have committed. He loves you anyway, and he will take those failures, and he will deal with them and make them better and make you clean and present you spotless and blemishless before him. He will, he will do an an amazing job making you wonderful and complete and perfect, and he will do all of that for you, loving you the whole way through it, and you'd rather give up on that for a little temporary pleasure? Yeah. Worded like that, it's so easy to make the choice, but it's, it's the fact that we don't word it like that every day when we have those decisions to make. Let me ask, the last time that you decided to sin, I don't know what that is, I don't know when that was, I don't know what the decision was that you made, but did you frame it with the idea of, if I do this, I'm cheating on God? Because I imagine if you had, you'd have been much less likely to do the sin and much more likely to make the right choice. Right? I honestly think that is one reason Jesus was able to make the right choice every time. He knew a sinful choice was cheating on his father. And he was unwilling to do it. And we should be unwilling to do that too. 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 3 through 6. 1 Peter chapter 4, 3 through 6. Well, there's already been enough time spent in doing what the Gentiles choose to do, carrying on an unrestrained behavior, evil desires, drunkenness, orgies, carousing, lawless idolatry. They are surprised that you don't join them in the same flood of wild living, and they slander you. They will give an account to the one who stands ready to judge the living and the dead. For this reason... The gospel was also preached to those who are now dead, so that although they might be judged in the flesh according to human standard, they might live in the spirit according to God's standard. Again, our behavior should be so dramatically different than the world's behavior that they are astonished by the way that we live they are amazed that we would make different decisions, and they, they just cannot believe that we would not join them in the pleasures they have to offer because we, we are so willing to live differently. Again, this is part of what we were talking about th this morning. 
I, I think sometimes what we often do is that we choose right living, but we're going to do our right living in private. We're, we're going to be very closed off about it. You know, we don't use the same words they use, but we're not going to make a big deal about it. We don't want to make anybody uncomfortable. And so we, 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 we just we use euphemisms instead. So we kind of fit in, but we kind of don't fit in. Uh, but that way, we're, we're kind of just, we're a mixed bag. We're, we're, we just, we're, we're not standing out too much. Or, or you know, yeah, they, they go and, and they, they have their drinking parties, and it's a company party, so I kind of feel like I have to go. So I'll carry around a glass of alcohol, but I'm, I'm not going to drink it. So I'm, you know, I'm not giving in to sin, but I'm not really standing out. I, I'm just, I'm, you know, I'm not going to sin, but I'm, I'm going to keep that that moral living side of my life secret. You know, that, I, I I might not watch all the shows that they watch, but I'll watch enough so that I can keep having conversations with people and still fit in with them. Or you know, I. I might not wear something as revealing, but I still want to look very fashionable, and, and therefore I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of, uh, I won't cross the line. You see how we do this? We, we find every way we can to, to keep the rules. So we got that foot over here on God's side, uh, but, but we don't really want to stand out, and so we'll, we kind of keep one toe over there if we can reach. We still want to be relatable. We have nice words like that that we use that make us feel better and more justified by the decisions we're making. We need to be really careful about that. If our kind of living isn't noticeable to a world that lives without God, then we're not living right. And I'm not saying we should put on some sort of false morality, and I'm not saying we should act a certain way so that we can bring attention to ourselves. But I'm going to tell you right now, if you're living right morally in a world that is immoral, you should stand out. You should be different. And it is by being different that you are essentially putting up a billboard for God so that you can fulfill what it says over in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16. Let your light so shine before men, let it shine in such a way that they may see your good work and glorify your Father who is in heaven. I think if that was written about most modern Christians, it would say, let your light so dimly shine beneath a basket that the light's still there, but nobody notices. That's, that's sad. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest. I have a hard time not seeing that that is what the Scriptures are calling worldliness. We have to to be different than this world. 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 through 17, well-known passage. Do not love the world, and do not love the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride in one's possession is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world with its lust is passing away, but the one who does the will of God remains forever. Do you see all that? Everything that is in the world is not from the Father, but is from the world. Shouldn't we want to identify with the Father? Again, the Bible is so clear about this. It is we who have muddied this up and made things 
honestly, I, I think oftentimes we're motivated by wanting to make things easy. We want things to be easy. I'm going to be bold and tell you right now, God never promised comfort and ease. He never said that, that being a Christian was going to be something fun and enjoyable. Now, I think it can be. I'm not saying that if you had a laughter this afternoon that you were sinning by laughing or, or having a good time. I, I'm, that's not my point. I, I don't want you to swing to an extreme, but I do want you to understand that we cannot have both the world and a citizenship in heaven because the things of this world are not from the Father. Romans 12, 1 and 2, an even more well-known passage of Scripture. Therefore, brothers and sisters, in view of the mercies of God, I urge you to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true worship. Do not be conformed to this age, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may discern what is good, pleasing, and perfect will of God. Now again, it... I, I bet I could ask who in here has heard this verse no less than 500 times in your life and probably every hand would go up. It is a well-known passage of Scripture. And it is a well-neglected principle of living. We are told that our lives should be holy holy are they our lives should be focused on the things that belong to god are they because i i will throw myself out there for everybody to see and admitting this i live for me I shouldn't, but I do. I go do what I want to do. I do the things that make me happy. And, and, and none of those are immoral things that I, I can think of off the top of my head. I, I'm not out there carousing and drunkenness parties and orgies and those types of things that were mentioned over in First Peter. That, that's not the way I live but that doesn't change the fact that the way I live is often motivated by me and what I want and not by God and what he wants. And I need to do better on that. I am commanded here to present my body as a sacrifice to the Lord, a, a living sacrifice, meaning my every day should be as if I have gone to the temple and said, here I am, Lord, what do I do? Is that the way you live? Because that's what it means to belong to Christ. That's what it means to live for him. That's what it means to, to pull ourselves away from the world so that we can live for him. Now, I, I know in a lot of ways this is difficult because uh, it, there's a lot of ways in which we have to go out into the world and belong to it. I, I get that. We have to take care of our families. That's part of what God commanded us to do. Anyone who does not take care of his own is worse than an unbeliever. I, I, I get that. I, I understand that there are things in this life we have to take care of that take up our time, that take up our, our energy, that we have to do those things in order to, to physically live on this earth. I, I get that. But all of those things that we do on a daily basis should be motivated by what is it that God would have me to do. That should be our motivation. As Jesus says over in Matthew 6, 33, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be provided for you. Everything I do, ideally, 
and, and I'm speaking in ideals here, and an ideal that I, I struggle to meet every day. But everything I do should be motivated by what is right for God and his kingdom. Everything. The way I treat my wife should be motivated by the way that shines a light for the kingdom. The way that I raise my children, the decisions I make with them, should be motivated by what will bring them up to be uh, active and, and involved parts of the kingdom. The way that I work my job, uh, me as a preacher, that, that's kind of easy and cut and dry, but even if I weren't a preacher, the things I do on a daily basis, am I doing it in a way that shines a light for the kingdom? Is it? Because all we do should be centered on belonging to God in the kingdom and being on that side of the very broad line he has drawn down the middle of our lives and the choice he has given us to live. It's hard. I mean, it, it's one of those, there, there's nothing difficult about understanding what we've talked about tonight, but I also think that there's, there's a lot of things that are difficult about applying the things we've looked at tonight. And I get that. This is one reason we need each other. Uh, one of the greatest things I've loved to do with God's people is to sit down with a group of God's people and us have a discussion about, all right, so this situation came up at work. What would you do as a citizen of the kingdom? And have a discussion about what's the best thing we can do to shine that light. And I have learned so much about practical living from listening and learning from my brothers and sisters. That, that's something that's good for us to do. Because it, it honestly, if, if, if we're going to truly be a part of a citizenship that does not belong to this world, we need to make sure that we most definitely belong together as we try to go against this world and live differently. Now all that begins with becoming a child of God, and if you're not a child of God, I encourage you to become one. I encourage you to, to make the commitment to leave the world and belong to something better. And, and I can promise you what God offers you is better than what this world offers you. But for most of us who belong to the kingdom, I, I would imagine tonight's lesson has, a, I hope, at least made you go, there's a lot of things I can do better in this. And if that's the case, let's get through those things together. Let's, let's help one another be more of what God intends us to be. Let's, let's find ways that we can together shine a light and help one another shine a brighter light and be more courageous to take that basket off of our lamp so that our light can be brighter at work or uh, at, at whatever it is you're involved in in this world. Our light can be brighter. And if we work together, we can make that happen. If you need the invitation to get your life right, maybe you need prayers from the saints here. Maybe you need to be baptized into Christ. Whichever it is, please come forward and let us know as we stand and sing this song.